Praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I have in my hand a dime, a single dime. Amen. If I use this dime and I throw it against one of these walls, it won't make any impact on that wall. If I throw it correctly, it may make a nick in the wall. It won't do much damage. However, I might get chastised by pastor and ask to patch it up or pay for it to be patched up, but it won't make a huge impact on that wall, not this one single dime. But if I take this dime and I collect other dimes and get several, several other dimes and I melt them and melt them together, it's going to lose its face. It's going to lose what it looks like on here, all the beauty. It's going to lose all of that. But if I put it together with these other dimes and I connect it to something strong enough to use it and it turn and turn that uh, the group of dimes into a medicine ball, I can tear this building down. If this dime is willing to submit itself, if this dime is willing to be melted, if this dime is willing to lose its face, hallelujah. It can actually make an impact. I believe the Holy Ghost is telling me that the family of churches can do it. If we lose our own faces, if we lose our own beauty, we can take this city. We'll take every city we step into. We can do it, saints. And the devil will hear about it. Hear about shame. The devil has heard about us. And we can do it. Hallelujah to God. Amen. That's not my message, but I just think God wants you to know it. To be encouraged because we can do it. To be it's one family of churches. Hallelujah, and we will do it. Every word, every promise that God has given this church will come to pass. And I just need to stay with the family of churches, lose my identity, lose who I am, and just become one church. Amen. We'll make an impact. Amen. On this city, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Thank God for Pastor. Uh, Collins and Sister Collins and Bishop Davy and Sister Davy allow me to be here. I, I forgot how I said the other night, I forgot how big this podium was. Amen. But I'm glad to be here with the family of churches. I'm not going to hold you long. As I've always said when I get up here, let's get into the word of the Lord. I'm going to go on the book of Mark chapter 7. I'll read a few verses of scripture there. Mark chapter 7 beginning in verse 24. Amen. Mark chapter 7. Verse 24. I read verses 24 through verse 30. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, the word of the Lord reads, And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into an house and would have no man know it, speaking of Jesus. But he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she bought, besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come out of her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. And for a title tonight, Changing Your Season. Changing Your Season. Amen. Pastor, will you pray? Praise Bishop. 
Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this word. Thank you for this man of God tonight. Anoint him, Lord, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Lord Jesus, let this word change us and deliver us and set us free. Use this man of God tonight for your glory. Have your way, have your way, have your way in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. Let the church say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for saying that you may be seated. In the house of the Lord. I know that seasons are important naturally and spiritually. I know that they are important. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in verse 1, it says this, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. That is to say that we have certain seasons and they're all uh, given to us for a reason. And so we need seasons in our life. We need the spring and the natural so that we can grow some things in the spring, typically, uh, the, the weather is in such a way that we can grow a lot of things. Uh, the summer then comes and then things grow more quickly because there's a lot of sun. Plants typically grow a lot faster in the summertime. And then in the fall, things slow down a bit. So need that also because you don't want overgrowth. And then in the winter, typically things die in the winter. So you need all of that because you don't want overgrowth, but you don't want to die of starvation either. And so you need the seasons, you need them to go uh, the way that God allowed them to go. And we go through seasons spiritually in our lives as well. We go through good times and bad times. We have what we call spiritual highs and spiritual lows. And sometimes it's simply because we're going through a season. Sometimes we get frustrated in some seasons because it's not going the way that we want it to go. However, uh, we need those seasons as well because they will uh, balance us. I remember when I first got saved and maybe a few times even after that, I've had conversations with Bishop Davy, and he would tell me, he would say, well, son, you really don't want to be all the way up here and all the way down here. You need to learn to be like this and you need to learn to even kill. And so that's true. And I believe seasons come to give us sometimes that we don't get depressed. The Lord will bring us up to a place and we can jump and we can shout because everything is going well. However, there'll be some times that we'll go through desert type seasons where it's dry and humid and nothing seems to be going our way and doesn't seem like God is anywhere near us. And we need all of those seasons, those seasons that we that things seem dry, um, just test our faith. And then God will stir up our faith when things finally do happen. We need all of these seasons. I'm proposing to you, though, that your seasons are really based on you oftentimes. Sometimes we can't control the weather. We can't control what we do all the time and what our uh, external circumstances are all about. But I believe there's a way that we can change our season. I believe that there's a way that it doesn't matter what season you're in, even if you're in a bad season right now, that God gives us a way to change our season. And so tonight I'm going to bring to your attention three points that will suggest or show that you can change your season. I don't know where everybody is in the building tonight, but I'm telling you that no matter where you are, if you're in a bad place right now, tonight you can change your season. You can change where you are right now. Amen. I'm just believing and trusting God that your season will change tonight. Firstly, we talked about the Syrophoenician woman, or we read about her, and I'm going to talk firstly about the fact that it was just not her season. Just not her seasons. Consider Mark chapter 7, verse 24. The Bible says this in verse 24, And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre. And again, I said earlier that this is talking about Jesus. He went to the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into the house and watched this and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. Jesus was previously in Genesaret, and he was teaching, and he was healing individuals. People were being healed. Uh, they were being laid in the street as Jesus would pass by. He would heal them. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some individuals had come down from Jerusalem into Genesaret. These Pharisees had come down there to, uh, to just observe Jesus. And as they observed him, they're observing even his eating habits. They were just so uh, meticulous in what they thought and, and just picky, you know, because they, I don't even want to see how you eat Jesus. They want to find some way to accuse Jesus and find some fault in him. And so they, they come just to watch him. They didn't come from anything uh, whatsoever. Sometimes you got to be careful. You don't want to come to church just to see what's going on. You really want to come with something better than let me just see what you're talking about today. Let me just see if this church is a real church. You believe it or not, some folks just come for that reason, and they'll miss out on what Jesus can really do for them. Let me just come and see 
and see if I can pick at something. Well, this is what they did. And because of this, I believe Jesus, well, firstly, he corrected them and told them about them and their traditions and why, you know, they didn't really need to wash their hands. I'm not telling you young people that you don't need to wash your hands before dinner. Your mom tells you to go wash your hands before you eat. You need to wash them. So don't be using this scripture to be disobedient. Well, Jesus didn't have to wash his mom. Well, he, they, they were just having a problem. The Pharisees were having a problem with Jesus and his disciples not washing their hands. So they started talking about their own particular traditions. Nothing uh, uh, in the law, per se, but it was their own traditions. And Jesus began to correct them regarding their own traditions. But I think he got annoyed with them. Here he is. He's doing all these miracles. And they're picking at something that really doesn't even matter. So the Bible says then that Jesus got up and left. I don't want Jesus to get up and leave because he's here to do something great, but I'm just picking at some of the little stuff. Well, I don't really think this, and I don't think the pastor should say that, and I don't think that God is here to do something great for our life. Sometimes we just too picky. You, you, you too picky, Jesus might just say, you know what, fine, I'm just going to leave because you're not really worrying about what I'm here to do. So he got up, and here's the thing. He left Genesaret to go to the borders of Tyre and Sidon. There is no really good scriptures about Tyre and Sidon. The prophecies concerning Tyre and Sidon really talk about how they were in fornication and really talking about adultery, uh, I'm sorry, um, idolatry, and all type of wickedness that was going on in Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus probably strategically says, I'm going to go to their borders because if I do that, nobody's going to follow me over here because they're so religious anyway. So I'm just going to go over closer to their border. Now, the Bible, in one place, in Matthew, it seems as if he went in, but here it says he went to the border. So, uh, or it says he was in the coast of Tyre and Sidon in Matthew, but in reality, he probably was right on the edge of Tyre and Sidon. He said, well, they all wicked, so I don't know if I'm really going to go in there. But I'm at least far away from those religious folk who can't get anything because they're just so picky. So he, he moves himself over there, getting away from these folk, and... Then as he does that, this woman hears about him. I don't know how she heard all these wicked folks. She's from this, period, this area in Canaan, um, and she is hearing, wait, I, somebody say they saw Jesus around. And I don't know how she got somebody to witness to her about Jesus. I don't know how the word spread because these were wicked folk, and we know that the religious folk weren't going over in there. But somehow or another, she heard that Jesus was somewhere around. And so she began to probably knock from house to house to find out where Jesus is. Has anybody seen Jesus? It's a wonderful thing for us to say, you know what? I'm not here to pick at anything. I'm just here to find Jesus. And so she, she's looking around and she finds Jesus. And when she finally finds Jesus, she comes into that house. And sometimes people just went into other people's house back then. Jesus could be somewhere, and you just knock on the door. Who are you? I'm not even here to see you, but this is my house. This wasn't Jesus' house. Say, so I'm not even here to see you. I don't care who's in the house. I'm just here to see Jesus. I don't care how you look at me. If I look funny coming in here, I don't look like I belong in this place. Listen, keep in mind, I didn't come here for you. I came find, to find Jesus, and all I know is I heard that he was here. I just heard that he was here. I, I can be a stranger. I can look different than everybody else. I just know Jesus is here. And so she came to Jesus, and she knocks on the door, and she walks in among all these disciples that was with him, and she probably felt somewhat immediately because she knows how the Jews thought of Tyre, Sidon, and all the individuals that were the Greeks or Gentiles. You can call them whatever. So I know how y'all think about me. I know what you think. But I'm going to come in here anyway because, again, I'm looking for Jesus. I don't really care about what people think about me. If I got a need from Jesus, I, I, that's who I'm here to see. And so she walks in there, and she begins to talk to Jesus, and she says to him, she's ignoring everybody else, and she's saying, hey, hey, listen, I have a daughter at home, and my daughter is all messed up, and I need you to help her. And one portion of Scripture tells us that, it, that Jesus ignored the woman. Most of us know the story. We've heard it several times, I'm sure. And Jesus ignored her, didn't say anything to her at all. Jesus didn't say anything to her until after his disciples started complaining that she was even in the building. They started telling her, telling Jesus, well, what is this woman doing? She's not supposed to be here. And then Jesus talks to her after that. Jesus says to her, and if we turn to Matthew 15 and 24, here's Jesus' response to her. He says, but he answered and said, I am not sent 
but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What was Jesus saying? Jesus wasn't saying that he didn't love her. Jesus wasn't saying that he didn't have any desire for her daughter to be delivered and healed. It wasn't anything like that because it was the will of God that everybody be saved. It's the will of God that right now that everybody be saved. No matter who you are, no matter whether you feel like you fit in or not, it is the will of God for you to be saved. It's the will of God that that daughter was delivered. God wanted that to happen. As a matter of fact, that was part of why he came in the first place. Not just to continue to deal with Israel, but eventually he had a plan for all of mankind. It's not the will of God that any man should perish, but all should come to repentance. So it's always been on the mind of God to deliver us. However, it just wasn't the right time. He told her, listen, I have came first to deal with them, then I'll deal with you all. That's his timing. He was just letting her know, listen, it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't have a desire. It's simply that this isn't your season. It's their season, but it's not your season. And sometimes because we understand that seasons happen for a reason, we'll just say, you know what, it's just not my season. I'll wait until. Because later on down the line, we find in um, Acts chapter 21, Paul in Tyre. And so he was there, so they heard the word of God. So, it, you know, God wanted to be there eventually. It just wasn't her timing and wasn't her season. And so if she understood some biblical stuff about seasons and understood about the atmosphere and the seasons and so forth, she might have said to the Lord, I understand it's simply not my season. Therefore, I'll just leave it alone and wait until my season shows up. And we could do that. And I'm not saying sometimes we won't have to do that because as I mentioned earlier, I'm not against seasons. I believe that we have a need for seasons because they develop us and they make us better. However, every once in a while, I thank God for seasons. And I know I need my dry times and I know I need sometimes I just need to have faith. But every once in a while, I need my season changed. I need something to happen Right now, this very hour, if it's not happening for nobody else, because sometimes we got to wait to see if it's happening somewhere else. We need to see if the rain is falling somewhere else or if there's dew on the ground or if there's some sign that it's the season for this or that. We have to wait for the signs. But sometimes when there's absolutely no signs whatsoever, there's nobody else getting blessed like this. There's nobody else doing this thing. I still want it to be my season. So this woman, she sticks around because she wanted her season to be now. I wish that there'd be somebody, when they come into the house of God, that they say, listen, today is my season. Right now is my season. My season is right here, right now. I don't care what he's preaching. I don't care what they're talking about. This is my season. Secondly, here's the thing about it. Here's how to change the season. It's about positioning. It's about your position. The seasons are determined by the earth's position as, as it's uh, related to the sun. It's the earth's positioning as it rotates on its axis and the orbital stuff and all of that stuff. Look it up. Google it. You can probably find a YouTube video to show you what it's all about. Bottom line, it's all about the positioning of the earth will determine your season. The northern and uh, southern hemispheres have different seasons, but it's always based on their, the, earth, the earth's positioning. Currently, it's wintertime. I know you can't tell it. I don't know what it is in Florida, but I'm talking about the rest of the earth that's normal. But around these parts, I mean, everybody's going to the beach on Christmas. Ain't nothing right about that, no way. But currently, winter is supposed to start in what's called the winter solstice, which begins on December 21st or December 22nd. That's when it's supposed to start getting cold. In the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, which is like Argentina and Australia, at the same exact time, it becomes uh, summer during that particular time. And it's at its hot. It's at the, uh, the summer solstice, which that day at its, at its hottest. Over here, it's supposed to be at its coldest. It's all about the positioning of the earth and where you are on the hemisphere. Whether you're on the southern hemisphere or on the northern hemisphere, it's all about positioning. I believe that my season is based on my personal positioning. 
I need to be mindful of what my position is in particular. It may be somebody's season of coldness over here, but it could be my season of heat and warmth over here. Somebody is dying over there in their season, but if I can change my positioning, here's what, here's what the woman says to the Lord. She says to him in verse 28 of our text, and she answered and said unto him, yes, Lord, I understand it's not my season. I recognize it's not my season. But she says, watch the position of the dog. She says, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's drums. The dogs are positioned at a low place, and they're in a place where they can receive the bread. Listen, I might not be sitting up there, and I might not be looking as pretty as everybody else, but I know how to position myself so I can at least get some crumbs from God. I can at least get some crumbs from the table. I don't care what you call me. I can, I'll take the low position because every once in a while, it's the low position. That's going to get what you need. It's the low position. And the Bible lets us know in Matthew that she came and worshipped him. The low position is a position of worship. She didn't come to him expecting that, well, you need to look at me. And because I'm a human being, you need to love me. And her positioning in her mind, in her spirit, wasn't one that I earned this thing. No, 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 no. She said, listen, I don't really care about seasons. I don't really care about uh, pos uh, who, where everybody else is. All I know is I'm going to come down and I'm going to fall under the table. I'm going to lay down. And all you need to do is brush some of that stuff down. And I know. That'll be all I need. It's all about positioning. Sometimes we're not getting what we need because our position is wrong. We need to change our positions. We need to change our, our way of thinking about things. If you can't, you can't change the earth, but I can move to Argentina right now and it'll be war for me. Sometimes I need to change where I am spiritually. Adjust your positioning. Adjust it from being up here to being down here. Don't worry about what everybody else is thinking. Change the way you put our position, and God will bless you. Lastly, I considered all of this stuff, and then I said to me, now if the dogs get the crumbs, if the dogs can change, if the dogs can get the crumbs, Mark 7, verse 29 says, and he, she said, uh, he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. So this dog, as it were, this Gentile outside of her season can actually get a blessing and a miracle from God. If that can happen, what about the children of God? If, if her miracle was a crumb... What am I doing? Now are we the sons of God? If the dogs can get the crumbs, what can the people of God get? If this Gentile dog, though Jesus did not want to be found, at least the Samaritan woman, it, the Bible says in John chapter 4, that Jesus said that I must needs go through Samaria, and it was probably because he was going to meet that Samaritan woman. At least he must needs go through there with her in mind. But here, the Bible lets us know he didn't even want to be bothered with her. He was trying to hide from her. And she was able to find him. How much more the people of God, if we seek God with everything that we got, if we pursue after God who's trying to get a hold of us, Surely we should be able to find him. I think sometimes the problem is we don't seek him hard enough. We don't pursue long enough. We just don't look hard enough. We don't bang on every door. We're not asking around. We're not trying to find him hard enough. She looked for a man who did not want to be found and found him. Don't tell me I can't find God in my dry season. It's not your season. I can't find God anywhere. Keep looking. Keep looking. Because even if he doesn't want to be found, the Bible says he could not be hid. I'm telling you, God can't be hid. If you look hard enough, if you pray hard enough, if you, if you seek hard enough, I don't care what your situation is. Don't tell me, well, maybe it's not the will of God. It wasn't his will that she found him. I'm not trying to be found. He's, I'm going to find you anyway. I wish somebody would say, God, I haven't been healed yet. I'm going to find you anyway. 
I haven't been blessed yet. I'll find you anyway. You're not here seemingly. I can't get a word. I can't get whatever. I'll find you anyway. She got the crumb. We should get the whole meal from God. We should be, it's a children's table and it's a children's bread. Even the ungodly can get a miracle. Surely I can get a miracle. God has pulled me out. God has delivered me. I'm telling you something, saints. Let me tell you this. If all of our churches begin to pursue God and seek after God like this, miracle signs and wonders will break out in our services every single time because even the crumbs will heal the ungodly. We should be healed. We should be delivered. We should be able to walk uprightly. We should have miracle signs and wonders every single service. But our positioning sometimes is wrong when we come into the church. And we come into the church expecting God to do some great and wonderful things. And we come into the church giving God thanks already, not worrying about who's preaching and what they're preaching all about. All I know is that when I find Jesus up in this place, we're going to see miracles. We're going to see signs. We're going to see wonders. This is the year that we're going to see those things. It's a year of influx. God is going to bring some things to pass for the church of the living God. Change our positioning. A church of worship, a church of expectation, a church of praise, a church that comes in and you don't need to be pumped up to praise. You're already praising God. You're expecting something great to happen already. You're just expecting you to get that miracle that you wanted. Change our positioning. You can stand. I'm done. Change your positioning. Sometimes, here's the problem. I, I talked about praise this morning. I say sometimes, here's the thing about praise. One of the, the words I talked about is seven Hebrew words for praise. But I talked about this halal. Halal is probably used more times in Scripture for praise than any other thing. And one of the things about halal, it says that, and I talked about how David had uh, went before uh, that king Abimelech, and he was acting mad to get out of that thing. The Bible says he was acting mad. Well, the word there, mad, means halal. It's halal. And I said, now listen, sometimes what you need to do, if you really want God to get you out and God to bless you, you need to learn this stuff. But here's the problem. We're scared of looking foolish, which is what halal means also. We don't want to look foolish. This woman right here, she doesn't care. When we get over ourselves, we get over what our neighbor is doing next to us. I hear Pastor Colin say from time to time, just tell your neighbor, move over, because you're going to elbow him in a minute. When we forget about our neighbors all around us, we're not worrying about it. We're just simply saying, listen, this is my season, and I'm going to praise until I get it. I'm going to worship until I get it. I'm going to stay before God until I get it, because I got to get it. This is my season. I don't know about anybody else. This is my season for my blessing. This is my season for my anointing. This is my season. Is it your season? Is it your season? Is it your season? You determine your season. Make it your season. I wish somebody would make it their season. Sometimes we're waiting for the cue. You got the cue. Make it your season. Why don't you worship God? Why don't you praise God? Why don't you... I never see an altar call in the New Testament. I never see an altar call in New Testament. Nobody had to say come down. The people who got miracles just came down. Anybody who wanted a miracle just came down. Nobody, Jesus never said come down. They just knew he was there. I wish we would just know he's here. I can't wait till the church just knows Jesus is here. I've never seen him do an altar call. We wait for the altar call. But the people who got miracles just broke up the service. They didn't care about an altar call. They said, it's my season, and I'm going to get it right now. Even if I interrupt the speaking, even if I interrupt the preaching, even if I interrupt the announcements, I got to get my miracle. It's my season. It 
it's your season. You better take it. We got to get over ourselves. Jesus is just as real then as he is now. It's the same God. It's the same God. And he shows up. It's our season. It's the family of church's season. Because we'll make it our season. And we can. And we will. And nothing will stop us. We'll make it our season according to the word of God. We'll make it our season. One body. This is our season here in Mokosha.